Welcome back, all of you. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, just let me know briefly through the comment section if you're here and if you've joined me, because you know I can't really see you. But I have one more interesting feature today. If any of you is wants to join me in this stream and talk to the class or me directly. Just follow this link that's showing in the comments, and I will put you on the screen, and then you can talk to us or pose your question. So good. I see quite a few people here. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, today we'll be talking about Louis Althusser's famous essay, Ideological and Repressive State Apprentices. Um, good. Good, Dalton. Good to know you're doing well, all of you as well. And so as you might have noticed, I've already recorded a lecture on it and posted it on my YouTube channel, which I do encourage you to watch so that you can ask me more questions. Now, my recording was a bit experimental because I did one part of the essay in which I actually used a teleprompter app and pretty much read my own discussion of ideology in one of my books. And I don't like teleprompters, I must tell you. I actually found it harder to do than just speaking like this. So, but do watch it. And if you have any questions, please bring them my way. Um, Althusser's essay is absolutely important for us to understand on different levels. One, of course, it gives us a more nuanced understanding of ideology itself, right? And then it's also one of the great examples of someone using psychoanalysis, especially Lacanian psychoanalysis, to theorize the question of the human subject, right? And it also has a lot of usages. right? In literary theory, if we are reading a novel or if we are looking at a practice or a policy, you know, in politics, we can always look at the ideological aspect of it. What is it that doesn't coerce us, but incorporates us within the project of a larger system? How is it done? How is it that we internalize certain logics, certain systemic logics, and then perform our identities accordingly without even knowing it? All of that I mean, there are other ways of looking at it too, you know, theory of discourse and all, but I think Althusser's insights into ideology really, really uh, give us that kind of materialistic criticism and, and the skills involved in it. Uh, now, before I go in, Aaron, I would like to ask, uh, answer your question from your journal. Now, do keep in mind, I didn't claim that the critic need to be, to be, to be, obje be objective was trying to highlight how the new critics assumed the critics' role. And in that, objectivity was one part of it because they were trying to make it scientific. But we all know that even when we are writing a paper without using the first person pronoun, and we are using vocabularies that sound objective, a lot of our subjectivity is invested in that practice. And now after reading ideology, we already know that even when we are performing an objective identity, that identity is in so many ways over-determined by the ideology that we are in. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, so going over to Althusser. Now this essay, even when it was published, I think the book is called Lenin and Philosophy, uh, it was published as a tentative, unfinished product, right? It was like thoughts on the edge, but it has gained a lot of prominence because it was first of the major Marxist essay that relied on Lacanian psychoanalysis and, and attempted to answer the, the question of ideology. Uh, now, ideology, I always say in the lecture also, explains it is that in the classical Marxism, ideology is what we call, it's connected to knowledge, right? 
And what does that mean? That's why we call it the epistemological model of ideology, because in Marx, ideology is this systemic veil or systemic hiding of the truth perpetuated by the superstructure, by the dominant classes, because of which the workers, instead of seeing the world from their own point of view, see and experience the world from the point of view of their oppressors, from the point of view of the capitalistic class. And so the question in Marxism was how to undo that ideological uh, filtering so that the workers can see their own lived experiences from their own class interest and not from the class interest of the dominant classes. And that was the project that a lot of people tries, try to answer. Lenin tries to answer it by suggesting that there will be a vanguard that will be created. That's what we call vanguardism. And this vanguard's job would be to educate other work workers about their own exploitation. Uh, eventually the communist, the centralized communist party takes on the role of educating the workers. Now, if you have read your Paulo Freire and other leftist uh, scholars, they would assign that role to education, right? But deep down in all that thought, there is a certain centered human subject that is imagined. So the main criticism of it is the, the sheer humanism of it. Because if we are re reconciling alienated labor to their true selves, then we must also imagine that there is a true self in here, which if we undid the ideology will be reconciled with, right? So the question of alienated labor, then what is alienated labor? So in order to theorize that, what Marx and others theorize is that we as human beings are naturally productive. We want to make things, right? But in the capitalistic society, in order to live, we go and take on a job which we were not meant to do just to sustain our material existence. And since we are doing something that is automatic, that we are not interested in, that we don't want to do, we are alienated from the project of our own labor. So disalienation or disalienating labor would be to remove them from that bondage and to reconcile them with what they were meant to do or wanted to do. But that presupposes a central human subject with a core, right? And that becomes problematic in post-structuralism. So what Althusser is then trying to do, and you can go into more details of his concept of ideology in my lecture that I've already recorded. What he's trying to answer is, two questions in that essay, right? The first is that a capitalistic society has two functions, right? It must produce commodities, but then it must reproduce itself. And by that, what he means is that it must reproduce its productive structures, who does what, or what is assigned to whom, right? Who can do what kind of a job? How do we decide that in a democratic capitalistic society? Because we can't tell people, your father was a plumber, you must be a plumber too, right? No, because our role in life is not decided by birth, right? And he says that that is done ideologically. In order to theorize that, then he theorizes the question of the human subjectivity, but also that there are two ways power or superstructure works, right? Through dominance, which he takes from Antonio Gramsci, right? And through hegemony, but he gives them different names, right? The concepts come from Gramsci. There's a footnote in that essay where he acknowledges that. And Antonio Gramsci, you all know, was an Italian Marxist. <clears throat> so what he's saying is that the repressive state apparatuses are the one at the disposal of the state, police, the justice system, the legal system, incarceration, all the things that we fear that if we don't do the right thing, we will get in trouble with the law and all that. Those are the repressive state apparatuses. But what, I, what Althusser is suggesting is that the state most of the times functions through ideological state apparatuses, right? In which, in a way, if we come through Gramsci, we give our willing consent. And he gives the example of education, right? The system of education 
as a mode of ideological state apparatus because it does a, a few things. First of all, it disciplines us, disciplines our bodies, makes us the part of the project of socialization, right? Two, it also assigns our, our, us our place in society. Depending on what we study, where we study, we internalize the possibilities that we have, right? Now, that is done through education, that is done through ideology. Now, keep in mind that Althusser does suggest that, that the fear, the threat of violence is always there. The state has it at its, its disposal, and it's also at the back of our minds. But most of the times, what we do in life is materially determined by this apparatus, which is ideological. Now that takes me to the question of apparatus, right? Apparatus for, or apparatus for Althusser is material. That means that it's not theoretical, it's not, it exists, right? It has institutions of power, a body of law, right? Police, justice system, a system of bail and incarceration, all of that is material because it's a dispositive, it's a system. And when we are caught, when we are overdetermined by a certain ideology, our performance is also material because it shapes our actions. It determines for us what we can and cannot do. Now, do keep in mind that Foucault studied with Althusser. If you read theory of discourse carefully, especially you know the uh, uh, early Foucault, the archaeological Foucault, like how uh, is the body disciplined? He's drawing from this, okay? There is no doubt in my mind that the, the, the discursive, uh, think of what Foucault argues, a discourse is material, right? And it has material consequences. That's exactly what Althusser is saying for ideology. So overall, you know, what can we do with this? We can pick up a novel, right? And read it to understand, you know, what kind of, oh, ideological overdetermination is at work in the novel. What does the author take for granted, right? Um, think of like any conservative novels, if Atlas shrugged, shrugged, right? What is the logic of the novel? You know, the, the novelistic world, what ideology is it in? It's in an ideology which believes that people with wealth are more useful. They are the ones who carry the society and its burdens, and everyone else who relies on them is, is non-productive and is a burden on society, right? For us to follow the logic of that novel, we can't just do that at gut instinct. If we agree with if Atlas Shrugs' main narrative, we agree with it because ideologically we are aligned with what it's seen. Now, the same novel, if offered to me at a young age, uncritically, can also then determine which ideology can I be a part of. So education then can do that, right? Um, these are like some of the uses of the term. Now, another crucial point, and you can see my cat running around in the back. Another crucial point in this essay is also how Althusser discusses the question of ideology and human subject. Now, at one point he says that ideology is the means through which individuals make the world intelligible to themselves. That's what he calls the ideological transposition of the real. Now, in order to really understand what transposition is, we have to know Lacan. And we have to know the difference between the symbolic order, right? and the imaginary order. Now we know that in the imaginary order, we are prelingual. And we have somewhat access to the real because we, we see the real and think it is real, even though that is a fiction, right? But when we enter language, we cannot really access the real non-ideologically, right? Or non-linguistically, right? So in order to explain his ideology, what he's saying is that ideology doesn't over-determine us per se, but it's the mode through which, it's something through which we understand the real, we understand the world, right? 
it makes the world intelligible to us. So our understanding of the world then is deeply ideological, right? And so if we take the concept of the subject in al Tusser, what we know is that what he's saying is we are all born subjects because we have a last name, we, we are expected, our parents raise us, so we are human subjects. And then as we enter the symbolic order, our subjectivity is stabilized and constructed through what he calls interpolation, right? And how are we interpolated? We are interpolated through the act of hailing, which is ideological, right? A police officer stops you, hey, you, that's the example he uses. At that moment, when you turn and acknowledge that hail, you immediately know who you are, right? That is who you are, that I am. Professor Masood Raja, the cop has just called me. It immediately concretizes your idea of self to you. That self, that subjecthood was already given to you. And then it stabilizes within a given ideology. And then what he also suggests is that there is no outside to ideology. So all there is no non-ideological place or position since that place would be the imaginary order and the real, and we cannot access the real without language, without ideology. So all then we can do is move from one ideology to another. So this is kind of my uh, take on the essay. Now, if you have any questions, comments, please post them. If you wanna come on screen and wanna post the comment, I, here is the link. If you just click on it and follow the steps, it's not a very complicated process. I can put you on the screen. The link is in the comments right here. Uh, I can put you on screen and then you can ask me any questions you want. But pretty much combined with my recorded lecture and this, I think this covers pretty much all of it. Now, if you have specific questions, uh, do let me know. Okay, good. Thank you. I have a question here. Um, does Althusser discuss disruptions to ideological functioning like executive dysfunction? Not that the, he would use that term, preventing someone from acting on their... Uh, no, he doesn't discuss it, right? But as, as you know, I had mentioned uh, previously that what theory also enables us to do is extrapolate from the things we know. So maybe uh, we could extrapolate. The, the main thing would be uh, that even if we have the dysfunction and we are not acting on our ideological programming, we will still be ideological. We'll just be in a different ideology, right? That's what we can extrapolate from that. But good question. I'm I'm really not sure if I have the answer to that. I'll I'll have to do some research on it. But in this essay, he doesn't talk about this. What he does talk about is the the usage of question of lack is there, right? Uh, because we are seeking something, right? We are seeking outside of ourselves, which he calls the subject S. Now the subject S is the authority subject, God, the president, the principal, parents, you know, who send us the hail, right? And in order to receive that hail, we have to be part of that ideological system, but we, once we receive it, we start performing the identity as passed on to us ideologically by the subject S. Right? Think of it this way. I mean, uh, if you know anyone who's religious, right? Um, how do we always know if we are spiritual and religious as to what we are doing is morally wrong? It's because we have internalized the dictates of that particular religious practice. Now, of course, most of the times it doesn't matter. I mean, even if we are in an ideology, we, we do swindle people. We 
you know, cheat people. And that's also human impulse. So maybe the ideology can make us into human subjects who function within a system, but that doesn't mean that it gets imprinted on us, right? We, we can go ahead and do things that are completely opposed to that, to the ideology that we are in. But then our situation would be that we are in a different ideology, right? And maybe we are performing an identity related to one ideology, whereas deep down we believe in a different ideology, right? And then the idea of human subjectivity and performativity comes into play as well. All right, any other questions? So any other questions about al Tusser and anything else that you would like me to cover in Louis al Tusser, but also any questions about what we have planned for the next week? There will be no class on Wednesday, right? And but do read Plato's Pharmacy, the excerpt from dissemination of the, uh, and we'll talk about it. Um, and I'll try to record a lecture before that. All right, questions, concerns. No one wants to join me on the screen. Any other questions? How are you all doing, by the way? Cool. Okay, so I see uh, Sarah, Brooke, Brooke Beck. Okay, all of you have signed the attendance. Will uh, cool? Will the final exam be posted on Canvas? I'll try to post it on both on Canvas as well as Postcolonial Space, but it certainly will be posted on Postcolonial Space, and I will also email you the questions. We still have to decide on the date, but I'll know next week what exactly is the date. But at the least, you'll have a week to write it, right? That is for sure. Um, all right, so you all are doing well then. That's good. Uh, we are doing well too, uh, you know, uh, staying, staying at home and finishing the project, working on the garden, taking care of the pets, all that. And uh, I hope you all are being careful and taking care of yourselves. And I hope you're not overstressed about this course. It's just like three weeks to go, so don't worry. Um, I'll make everything clear and easy for you. So this was my kind of a live uh, revision of the recorded lecture already. So I hope this clarifies certain things, but what I would strongly request you to do, urge you to do is to watch the, the recorded lecture, but also to read the essay because there is no substitute for line by line reading of a complex essay like Althusser's. And then same applies to the excerpts from Plato's Pharmacy next week. Um, do read it. It's a dense text, but it will be a rewarding experience for all of you. If there are no questions, stay safe, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and I will see you next week with Yak Derrida. <laughs>